So today we'll be talking about ways you can partner with a variety of campus stakeholders. And for those of you in systems and consortia, your partnerships may be a little different, but I think some of the collaboration challenges are probably similar. Um, we only have an hour today, so this list isn't going to be exhaustive. Uh, I encourage you to think creatively about all of the potential campus partners at your institution. Um, Lily and I are going to do some of the talking at the beginning, um, but that then we're going to switch over to an interactive uh, session where we'll be asking you questions and um, this will be your chance to um, share resources, share ideas, ask questions, and uh, we'll be sharing that Zoom chat afterwards with all of the links. Okay, next slide, please. So one of my most important campus collaborators is the bookstore. And I'm really fortunate to be on a campus at the University of Arizona that has a campus owned store. Um, but I've been attending Sparks sessions for the past two weeks on inclusive access with Follette and Barnes and Noble stores. And it, it's clear that some institutions um, have run into challenges with corporate stores, but others have found ways to build partnerships. So I really encourage you to reach out to your campus store if you haven't. Um, if you've tried and, and run into roadblocks, I encourage you to try again. It was quite a process for us to build this relationship. Um, there had been some bad blood before my time um, with our store, apparently, in the library. Um, it, what what really brought us together was a pilot that we jointly did um, and it was an e-reading platform um, and uh, that was a great way for us to, <laughs> to really get to know each other and to to go through all of the challenges with the pilots and to build those bridges um, we work really hard to exchange data and and referrals and so we're continually, um, we actually meet weekly with our bookstore um, as we're working on a new uh, course of affordability um, program. And uh, yeah, that we're continually sharing uh, lists of required textbooks and which ebooks the library can provide, um, sending emails back and forth. Um, so having that, that open relationship is, is really helpful to students and instructors. Um, we invite each other to sales pitches, and, and this came up in the Spark call yesterday about how aggressive all the course material vendors are about emailing instructors and campus administrators directly. And um, we have gotten into the habit now among our, our OER task force on campus to, to share that information. <laughs> um, hey, I got contacted by you know, top hat or, you know, there's so many. Um, and, you know, if, if one of them wants to come to campus to do a sales pitch, then we try to have them do it to all of us at the same time. So we're all getting the same information and they can't kind of <laughs> try and get in one back door to, to get around the rest of us. Um, I recommend joint presentations to campus. Um, we've had the bookstore come with us to departmental or college trainings. And that's really helpful. Um, when administrators during the pandemic were looking for what they thought were cost saving measures, one of the ideas that popped up was, hey, let's outsource our store to Barnes and Noble or Follette. And the bookstore leadership and I <laughs> knew that was a terrible idea that would not save money. Um, so we mobilized and um, got on the faculty's Senate agenda and gave a presentation and made our case um, for why that <laughs> should not happen. And it didn't. Um, you know, the president, the provost and the CFO were in the in the Senate session. Um, so yeah, it, it kind of providing a united front can be really helpful. Um, when the library can provide unlimited user ebooks, uh, that shows up on student book lists. 
uh, we've worked with our bookstore to have a little link that says, you know, check the library to see if this book is available for free. Um, we link to each other's websites. Um, we report uh, textbook savings jointly. And, and I'll say that there's a, um, I'll drop this in the chat. Iowa State did a really great graphic um, that actually my bookstore director found and said, we need to do this too. Uh, so we have a version of this as well. Um, let's see, each term um, we exchange the textbook adoption data. And um, I try to remind our faculty of when the bookstore's textbook adoption deadlines are coming up. So a few weeks before each deadline, I'll send an email to the all instructor list, reminding them that the, the deadline is coming up and why it's important for them to meet the deadline um, and offering help um, for finding free to use alternatives. Oh, no, it's not like, oh, sorry. I'll, mm. I should have checked it before this session. It, I'll, I'll try and find another, they might have moved it, but I'll try and find an, another way to get to it because it's a really good um, link. Sorry about that. Um, next slide, please. So um, a few years ago, I added this form to the library website. And when I email all of the instructors, I provide a link to it. Um, and so it allows them to say, you know, this is the textbook I want to use. Can the library get an unlimited user license for the ebook so that students can use it for free? Um, in 80% of the cases, we can't get it from the publishers to do restrictions on what academic libraries can buy as ebooks. Um, but in that case, we, you know, we try to suggest other free to use alternatives. So we can recommend OER or streaming video or articles um, through fair use or um, alternative ebooks. And that one on one help with instructors can be time consuming, um, but it's been an effective way to flip <laughs> what would be, um, you know, a, a book sold through the bookstore to something that's free for students to use. Um, next slide, please. Uh, another really key group of partners is um, instructional designers, and whether it's called your online learning division or your teaching and learning center, these go by a lot of different names on, on campus. Um, and it's been interesting to see how instructional design support has evolved on our campus. It used to be very centralized and now each college and even some departments are starting to hire their own. So kind of um, trying to make those connections and find out how that's um, how that's done on your campus can be effective. Uh, instructional designers are such great partners because when they're creating or revising a class that can be an ideal time for instructors to switch to OER. Uh, we have a kind of a learning community around instructional design that I've joined and, and helped done trainings for. Um, so, so getting linked in with that group has been awesome. I offered to do um, a libguide for them. And we've also done trainings on OER and copyright and Creative Commons licenses. And one of my projects for this summer is to develop a guide that shows instructional designers how they can import OpenStax content into course cartridges for our learning management system. Um, so kind of the, a train the trainer approach, um, you know, on my campus, I'm, I'm really the only one in charge of OER. So if I can train other people how to support OER, then I can really scale up my abilities on campus. Um, another thing we've we've done is um, try to jointly advertise webinars and workshops. Um, our, our teaching and learning center and instructional designers have access to listservs that we don't. And so promoting them jointly has been an effective way to, to get bigger turnouts. Uh, 
Um, we've done a, a few rounds of an OER and Pressbooks learning community at the University of Arizona. And I've found that far more effective than trying to do drop in OER sessions or, you know, hey, I'm holding a workshop and one person <laughs> will be able to attend. Um, so I've, I've got some resources and hopefully this link will work um, to the learning community that I set up a few years ago. Um, feel free to adapt anything that you find in there. Uh, it's it's really a nice way to build a community and to surface people that you didn't know were interested in OER. Uh, it it actually the first one that we led uh, resulted in our first big press books project. Um, I you know it, an instructor had gotten some grant money to um, to to do a project, and she didn't really know about OER press books. Um, but after doing the learning community, she completely revamped her syllabus to incorporate press books and open pedagogy into her class. And this um, Humans Are Social Media textbook has just taken off. <laughs> it's been so incredible to see uh, over a thousand. Oh, no, she's she's way where that she's over 10,000 views just this year. Um, and it's being used by other institutions. So, you know, you, you kind of start this spark and you really don't know where it'll lead. It's been really amazing to see. And yesterday I found out she won a teaching award. And so it's it's been really great. Um, referring and consulting together uh, has been a useful approach and, and seeking a seat at the table. Uh, we are in the midst of exploring whether to change LMSs. And I've been pushing really, really hard for the library to have a seat at the table for these campus decisions on technology that affect the library heavily. But historically, <laughs> we've been left out of these decisions. And um, you know, it kind of comes back to bite us. Um, we, a few weeks ago, I learned that our contract for D2L had been renewed for another two years, um, but nobody told us. <laughs> I found out from another campus partner. Um, so having a seat at the table is really important, especially when you know the <laughs> technology is so integral to all of the work that we do. And linking to each other's resources is also a, a, a really effective way to support each other and build those partnerships. Next slide, please. Thanks, Cheryl. So I'm going to talk about just uh, broadly some university infrastructure that you might want to consider um, embedding OER activity in. So one of the main uh, things to think about is the registrar and the course marking system. And a lot has been written uh, recently about this. And I know a lot of universities have uh, have established processes for um, signaling in the the markings in the in the registrar system about OER and low cost materials. And so that's definitely a conversation uh, that you could consider um, pursuing. And something that helps here just sort of just generally identifying what these systems are. Um, I know at my university, I'm at Rutgers, so it's a big big place lots of different systems are being used from one very different from one corner of the university into another and so just kind of having an inventory of what are these common university-wide systems that sort of define the experience of students and faculty um, and so once you get a handle of that then you can you can have a better understanding of how you might be able to um, uh, insert oer in them so for, for in terms of uh, marking systems, and we've linked us, us into the slide, a, a really nice um, extensive text on that that you will have access to after the presentation. Uh, but it is really important to, um, to kind of a, a figure out your approach, right? Because there's very different, there's many different ways of, of doing this. So you might want to, for example, identify just a course that's using primarily open educational resources or you might wanna be more broadly talking about affordability, um, or you might be doing both, right? So 
Um, as we know, in our conversations with faculty, we often blur the lines between OER and affordable. Um, so you just really have to establish that for your institution and you want to define what is a low cost, uh, what is a low cost material? I, I'm not sure that there's been a very good definition of that. And it, it's a very, um, it's a tricky one to think about. But those are the kinds of questions that you might want to uh, consider. And then in terms of advocacy, I mean, I found in this particular case, uh, students are really important. So getting students on board to say, hey, you know what, I, I don't, you know, I do think that we should have an idea from just the registrar and the course mark, uh, markings page about how much a, a course is going to cost, right? So that is just has to do with empowering the students to understand um, their role as consumers. Um, and so it's, it's important to get the students engaged with this issue and on board with it. And, uh, and then think about from the faculty perspective, uh, you know, does everybody participate in this? Um, you know, there might be some issues in certain departments. Like for example, I encountered um, a situation where one of, uh, so it's like, it was a popular course that had multiple sections and they were taught by multiple different instructors. And in one case, uh, several of them were, were okay with the idea of having um, OER or affordability marked in the in the uh, registration system. And then a couple of them were like, well, it maybe I'm not okay with it. And it kind of feels like we're competing if we do that, right? Because the students are gonna gravitate towards the course that is lower cost. Um, so it's a kind of a tricky internal department situation that you're gonna have to figure out how you how you want to deal with and maybe you want to have um, a model where people can opt in and out of that type of of course markings and then the other one that's obvious is of course the end of the semester survey you know i'm assuming most institu institutions do that by default every student gets a link to that you know that it's a pretty it was a pretty low um stakes uh, for, for us to have a question there about just textbook affordability, like, and also just perception of the course materials. So that's something you could think about as well. And moving on, um, other types of, of partnerships to, to think about have to do with, uh, again, I alluded to that before, but student government has been, at least in, in my case, a really important factor in moving forward to several different projects um, because you know, students have a powerful voice and they're very good, uh, specifically student, students that are involved in student government are very good with organizing around uh, different issues and, uh, and, and making change. So definitely be in touch with the student government about uh, affordability, about, um, um, about uh, educating faculty through students about open educational resources, also just kind of gathering information from them about what's really going on on the ground. I know that in my institution, I, for example, had no idea that a couple of departments had entered into these inclusive access slash um, first day access, I don't know what they call them now, types types of deal deals. And it's not like you're good, it's not like the campus sends out an email to alert you that these things are happening, right? You really hear about it because you have relationships with students who say, hey, what is this? You know, um, uh, are we okay with this, right? And so you could, you could gather a lot of information just by talking with students about what different departments are doing about affordability and how effective it is. And of course, student stories, that's, you know, that's the emotional core of, of everything that we do with OER is about how are students interacting with these uh, materials? Uh, how are they able to afford them or not able to afford them? You really do need on the ground uh, contextual information about your institution because that's gonna resonate the most with campus administrators. And then another, uh, you know, so at Rutgers, I was able to actually get some funding from student government to uh, fund a couple of our, our course redesign awards uh, a few years ago. It's not gonna be funding that's forever. And, um, and it's also tricky type of funding because it comes from student fees and there, there might be some red tape around it, but it's just, it's really not about the money. It's about the collaboration with the students and, and having them um, have a uh, feel ownership over this, this 
effort of promoting affordability and open educational resources. Now, the a big caveat here to point out is the fact that with student government, it's uh, it's you know, the turnaround is pretty crazy, right? So every year, pretty much you're dealing with a different set of students and you have to start these conversations completely fresh, uh, which can be um, which can be overwhelming. It might mean that you have some collaborations that last for a few years and then drop off. And then you just have to kind of remind yourself about the importance of working with student government and restart again. And of course, there, you know, there's different campaigns that students have to deal with and different priorities from year to year. So you may not be on their radar 100% of the time. Um, but again, it's just a very, very, to me, it's a very key, um, key aspect of collaborating with partners is to include students in them. And now I'm going to talk about um, faculty govern governance and promotion and tenure criteria. And there are some groups that have been doing some uh, awesome work around this. Um, so we've got some resources to share. Let's see, I'll drop those in the chat. Um, Doers has done some amazing work, and so has um, Iowa um, in terms of creating resources resources to help make the case for OER in uh, promotion and tenure. And, you know, we've had faculty say, you know, I really can't afford to spend time and um, money and, and effort um, working on OER if it doesn't count toward tenure and promotion. So there's advice on how to make the case uh, and some good resources there. Um, uh, as far as faculty governance, I've found that a really good way at a large campus like mine um, to build relationships with administrators and influential faculty. Um, normally, as a librarian, I would not <laughs> ever interact with our president and provost, but um, being now a member of the Senate Executive Committee, um, I, I get access to our provost on a regular their basis and can pitch ideas and and keep kind of making the case for uh, course material affordability and you know why that fits in with our other concerns about student basic needs. Um, we have the opportunity to shape policies related to textbook affordability and open access. So I'm I'm now co chair of the student affairs policy committee and. The committee a few years ago revamped our textbook policies to sort of close some loopholes that faculty were using to be pretty predatory about students and textbooks. Um, so we we tried to tighten those loopholes so that students can be couldn't be taken advantage of. Um, this related to an instructor, for example, who was posting free resources on their website and then selling them to students. And word has it, they made six figures before they were caught and shut down. So, um, you know, with that, that, that kind of activity, we do not want to see students taken advantage of. Um, so joining key committees like student basic needs task force, if your if your campus has one of those or anything related to student success, uh, that can be a really efficient way um, to to build those partnerships and really work for students best interests. Um, one of the things that we're currently working on with our administrators is being able to lock down parts of the nav bar in our learning management system. Uh, we have a, a library tools tab there that links to all kinds of library resources, in, including our, um, our ebooks that we provide uh, to for free to students instructors can delete it. <laughs> we have an entire college that deleted it. So because we've built these relationships with the administrators, we've been able to approach them and say, hey, can we can we lock that down? And now we're in talks with uh, central IT and, and all of that to make that happen. So if we didn't have those relationships, um, these things wouldn't be possible. And our dean is currently working, um, leading a, a task force to incorporate open access and OER into promotion and tenure guidelines. Um, the University of British Columbia has a good example. I'll 
drop I'll drop theirs into the chat of how this can be done. And next slide, please. Disability resources um, are another great partner, um, sometimes overlooked in, in uh, OER and course material affordability efforts. Um, but it, it, there's a lot of ways that we can help each other. And it's, it's so critical to make sure that OER are accessible to students. Um, so we can exchange resources. Uh, they have employees who can check some of our platforms and tools for accessibility. We've done jo joint trainings and exchanged information on things like lawsuits and best practices. Um, I've been involved in trainings where they're implementing a new accessibility tool and we're trying to figure out how that affects library resources. Um, and then linking to each other's uh, web resources as well. Next slide, please. Sorry, lost my unmute button. Um, so the next uh, couple of slides, Cheryl and I will just kind of comment on. <laughs> These are different things that we've both been involved with. Um, so first thinking about student success offices um, on your campus, and this could be because my position, so my, my first part of my title is undergraduate experience. And so, uh, you know, I come from this kind of perspective that's very much student centered and um, working with various like co-curricular units on campus. But I have found that there's actually an interesting way in which um, the work um, that we do with OER can can enhance and, and help the work that we do with student success with these units. Um, so it, this has to do with just with general cross messaging, right? So when you meet with um, any of these units and these could support, usually they support groups of students, right? That have been identified as, as being a priority to, to enhance their experience, such as first generation student veterans, uh, underserved uh, groups, which can be a very uh, large category um, of students. So just simple cross messaging is very effective there just to say, hey, the library, you know, we're already talking about the ways in which the library um, might surprise them, right? Might surprise the office and the students in terms of the offerings that we have and the, and the support we provide. Add to that the fact that we're, you know, we're also invested in open educational resources and affordability. That is one way in which we see our impact on campus. And so simple cross messaging can be very effective there. And then going a little bit beyond that and, and thinking about advising. So these uh, groups of students generally have their own methods of advising and they have, uh, you know, it's a very a structured kind of system. And so they're, they're kind of given the courses to take and a path to take throughout their um, undergraduate experience. And so maybe as, as they're being advised about the courses you take, you can throw in a suggestion for some affordable, some courses that you know on campus are open and affordable that you can recommend. Um, so that's one way to do that. Uh, and then when it comes to donors, alumni, and, and money for things like grants or stipends um, to incentivize OER, uh, it, it, some places have been really successful um, leveraging uh, you know, fundraising, uh, let's see, Virginia Tech, and there, there was another campus in, in uh, Texas that, that did, I think it was UT Arlington, did crowdfunding campaigns to raise money for OER. Um, Oregon State funds its publishing efforts with donor money. And at the U of A, we recently had a nursing, a nursing alum donate money for an OER publishing pilot. Uh, so there are those kinds of opportunities um, if you can work with your, um, you know, your fundraising uh, unit to, to make a case for OER and how it contributes to student success. That can be really appealing to donors and alumni. Um, and then um, we've also had some success partnering with colleges and departments on federal grants that include OER development, uh, for example, some USDA grants. And I know other programs have uh, successfully gotten some of the US Department of Education grants 
Um, and Amy Hoffer from Open Oregon recently shared a blog post on, on their approach to getting grants. Um, so I'll try and track that down. And I apologize for some of these links not working. They've clearly changed since the last time I shared them. So I should have checked them. I'll just add to that, Cheryl. Um, in terms of donor relations, you know, one thing to, to think about is that um, affordability efforts and the library's impact on that is always going to be a good story. It's a great story, actually, um, for the university to share. And so when these donors come to the university, um, what they want to do often is contribute to happy, good stories, right? And so making sure that, that you work with open educational resources is, is there um, as an option, as a menu option for them, it can, can lead to some good things. I know that at, at my institution, I was able to uh, use that approach to fund a couple of our course redesigns again, um, which, you know, some alumni just wanted to fund like a course redesign in biology. And so they gave us some funding, limited funding for that. And it doesn't have to be a, a huge amount of money. Again, it's just about starting that partnership and it could be a a, could just be a, a way in in for those conversations to happen in a larger scale. Thanks, Lily. Yeah. Uh, so also think about, you know, this is going beyond campus right now, but um, consortia and state and re regional partnerships. Uh, Doers 3 is it's a, a group of systems and states and provinces that collaborate on OER initiatives. Um, Arizona recently joined. And they've um, really focus on uh, different research areas and initiatives, and they've produced some really great reports recently. Um, there are four regional compacts for higher education that are all collaborating on different aspects of OER. Um, I'm in the, the Wichi uh, area in the West. Um, there's Nebi and, and Mech. Um, and uh, Tanya Spilavoy oversees all of the regional compacts um, as far as OER efforts, and, and she's doing some great work. Um, we actually met in person with Wichi um, in Denver a few weeks ago, and it was fantastic. My first in person meeting uh, in years. Uh, but it was great to to really spend a day and a half focused on OER in person. Um, there's a statewide leaders group that Rebel Coming Sauls in Florida organizes. Um, I can share the um, invitation with you. Uh, she also maintains a spreadsheet. Now, I hope this link works, man. I'm like oh for whatever on on links. But um, in case you're looking for other leaders in your state to connect with. She maintains this uh, spreadsheet. And I really encourage learning from other states. Um, I mentioned Open Oregon. They're doing fantastic things. California, Colorado, New York, all of these have been super successful at getting state funding and doing state initiatives. Yeah, uh, in the chats um, here in New Jersey, there's I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Vale, Vale, uh, Waldo, and sometimes Nebi. So good. Some of you are are plugged into these wider efforts um, that you know can be a, a good um, add-on to our campus partnerships. And just uh, you know, the more that we can work together, the more we can do. So, next slide, please. Okay, now um, now it's your turn, and I'll turn this over to to uh, Lily to explain this next part. All right, so we're hoping to use our time today to hear from you as well, because as Cheryl said in the beginning, you know, this is not an exhaustive list of partnerships. Um, by definition, uh, partnerships can can be very specific to your to your institution, and there's also so much more that could could be done just in general um, that that we want to hear about the things that you're thinking about. So we're just asking you to simply kind of think about the questions we're going to ask and then um, type into the chat any ideas that you've had, uh, either your own experiences or just like thoughts you've had or or any challenges, any opportunities, anything that you want to share with us. And then at the end, we're actually going to just download the chat and be able to share it out widely so that all of those resources 
and the links, which we'll fix, um, will be available 